Hello. China's first white paper on China and the World Trade Organization and its newly released list for expanded free trade zones aim to reaffirm continued reform and opening in many sectors. As the global market undergoes complicated changes, China is adapting to the world economic landscape and working hard to contribute to a restructure the global value chain. So, what's the nature of China's role in the WTO 17 years after entry? What will be the effect of the newly released free trade list to push more reforms? And in the big picture, where are the global free trade and multilateralism heading and what changes are coming? To discuss these issues and more, I'm very happy to be joined here in the Beijing studio by Mr. Matt Harbon, President of the EU Chamber of Commerce in Beijing, and Charles Liu, founder of How Capital, in the studio. That's our topic. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Rui. But before we get started, let's take a look at this. A milestone for Beijing's reform and opening up program as it looked to integrate into the global economy. China joined the WTO in 2001, embracing the world with open arms. The white paper gives a full account of the country's achievements since then. The country's WTO entry 17 years ago set off continuous improvements in the living standards of the Chinese people, rapid economic growth, and more importantly, the accelerated integration of the commercial interests of China and the rest of the world. The paper outlined that China has regularly been a significant contributor to global economic growth. When it joined the WTO, it was importing goods worth about a quarter of a trillion dollars annually. Last year, that figure jumped to nearly two trillion. China has also been a magnet for foreign direct investment. In the same period, it increased from nearly $50 billion to more than $130 billion. However, the government holds that China is now in a position to push for much more. We should insist on equal participation and transparent and open discussions. We must respect the will of the majority of the members and in particular focus on the concerns of the developing countries. The White Paper argues that protectionism and unilateralism are posing severe challenges to the global multilateral trading system. He calls on all countries to share the burdens of globalization and said China is looking forward to future opportunities for cooperation. Welcome to the studio discussion here. Matt, first of all, what are the points that appeal to you most about the shortened version of the negative list? Well, that it is shorter uh, appeals uh, to us and that some industries that we have asked for to be opened earlier are now open. Uh, but on the whole, we would have liked to see this list to be even shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, we also think that uh, to have two lists, one for China uh, na nationwide and one for the free trade zones, we think it should be one list for the whole country. That is what we are looking for. Do you see eye to eye with Matt on this idea of uh, combining the two, the special zones and the whole country? Well, I think it's a, it's a process. China is very large and has undergone really very fundamental changes in very the last Very much like the denuclearization process in the Korean Peninsula. <laughs> it's a process. <laughs> it's a process. <laughs> and the process has to address, aside from what the EU businesses would like, it also has to address what the Chinese people in terms of its population would require. Um, I think it's a process and it's a process that's in play. It may not be as fast as you like, but uh, it's going in the general direction of what is good. I think that w w our view is that we have seen uh, China using its free trade zones very successfully to uh, experiment with the reform and opening up. But we think that China has come to a point in its economic development that now it is better to start launching uh, nationwide what is needed because I think the Chinese leaders know quite well uh, the next steps that need to be taken. Uh, I, I, would, I would say one, one has to address this from another perspective as well. You have to protect your national economy. Given the potential of trade war looming, the potential of attacks coming not only from the United States but counterattacks from other countries, um, leading to a very unbalanced system of not knowing exactly where you will go. 
um, I don't think China really should move very quickly in this opening up. I, 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 that is another discussion, I think, which is <laughs> yes. separated from uh, the free trade zones as a vehicle yeah, for right. further re reform. But do you view the release of this white paper as a result of uh, the trade war which is looming larger and larger between the United States and China? President Trump uses uh, maximum pressure, fire and fury, to <laughs> show his anger with the alleged trade imbalance. And do you think the release of this white paper, Matt, and, and the, uh, uh, the result of or a compromise that the Chinese authorities have made? I, I don't think so. <coughs> I don't think so. I think it's a reminder. It serves three purposes. Number one is a reminder of where China has come from over the last two decades. That's number one. Number two is the further opening up is showing where China is going. It's the direction of where China is going. And the third is taking a very hard position on multilateralism and globalism. So it, it serves multi-purposes. Of course, no politicians uh, would show any signs of uh, being the first to blink in the standoff. Uh, look at what happened 40 years ago in China. This year, we witnessed the 40th anniversary of China's opening up. Many people argue that it's uh, our normalization of the relationship with the United States 40 years ago that forced China to further open itself up. And once again, today we have uh, this man, President Donald Trump, who imposes a pressure from outside on China, forcing China to open its market even further. Do you see any similarities between 40 years ago and what happens now? No, uh, I think what happened 40 years ago was driven by China's need to change its economic development model to integrate into the world. You mean we, uh, we decided to open ourselves up voluntarily, but this time around, coercive use of, uh, you know, uh, punitive tariffs uh, has been employed. Well, uh, you know, uh, our views are we, we don't agree with um, that method that um, Mr. Trump is uh, using. We think that we, we share the concerns that uh, the U.S. administration has been voicing, but we think that there are better ways forward to uh, get into dialogue with China to speed up um, the improvement of the areas where we see deficiencies. And perhaps uh, from a Western perspective, uh, it makes sense to combine the carrot and the stick imposing their maximum pressure on China. I don't see any carrot. I only see a stick. And I see a stick not only for China, but a stick for Canada, a stick for Mexico and the EU. It's a stick even to Japan. There's no carrot to talk about. Uh, President Trump calls uh, President Xi Jinping my great friend uh, <laughs> through many of his presidential <laughs> tweets. And I think we, we, we would like to just come back to what, what is happening now with the actions taken from the U.S. is something that we have talked about over the years in the chamber. We have said that when China is dragging its feet on um, implementing what it has promised in se itself in terms of opening up and reform, if that period of dragging its feet is too long, it will lead to consequences. And unfortunately, I think that is what we are seeing now, especially coming from the U.S. administration. Gentlemen, let's take a quick look at the specific details of the negative list, a shorter one. The list shows areas where investment is limited or prohibited for foreign investors, with all other areas presumed to be open. So what new opportunities will this bring to either, either Chinese or foreign enterprises? How about the challenges? First, Matt. Well, apart from that, we think the list is too short. Uh, of course, it gives <laughs> openings in areas like uh, energy. Uh, agriculture is a bit more uh, unclear to us. Finance, automobile, uh, automobile shipbuilding, and so on. These are welcome areas. Um, they, they were uh, announced even before the negative list, but this is something we uh, welcome. We also welcome that foreign companies are now able to participate in investing in fuel stations, for example, in China, uh, although it may be difficult for reasons of high land uh, prices and so on. But these are positive developments. What do you think of the American concerns? Will their concerns be alleviated greatly through this uh, delivery of the white paper? I, I have no idea what the American concerns really are. <laughs> On the one hand, you talk about reducing the trade imbalance, the def trade deficit. 
On the other hand, you talk about forced transfer of IP, and then you talk about imposing tariffs, which actually is going to increase the trade imbalance between the two countries. So um, one doesn't know what, not only tactically, but also strategically, what the real objectives are. It is very confusing. It's just like declaring Canada to be a national security risk to the United States when Canada doesn't have an army and uses a U.S. military umbrella to protect itself. So it's, you know, I, I, I think, um, of course, depending on what happens in midterm elections and, you know, he's, he can do something and declare victory. He just needs to declare victory, and that's all. One, one, one small question for both of you. Have you ever read the book written by Donald Trump, The Art of the Deal? Yes, yes. I have, actually. Yes, I have as well. Um, what image do you have about this president? Well, my image or, or, or in other words, uh, do you think he looks more presidential after more than one year in the White House uh, in dealing with the major economies and foreign affairs? But what we learned from the book is that his approach is that when you negotiate, you set the demands very high. High mm -hmm. bar. High bar. And then you, you compromise. If you set demands low, you get less. That, that is the... You have a very good command of Mandarin. We have a Chinese saying, qi fa qi shang de hu qi zhong, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's very much the same, right? Mm -hmm. You set the bar very high, you end up making a compromise. The, the, the issue is uh, how severe uh, are the demands for the other side across the negotiating table? Will, it, will President Xi Jinping be able to swallow the bitter pills? It's, it's no longer, I, I know the European Chamber of Commerce may have a different view. It, I, I really think it's no longer an issue of China and the United States. I think it's United States against the world. What they're, what they're doing in terms of now raising the high bar on auto automobiles. This is a, a very, very crucial or core industrial pillar for countries like Germany and Japan. But I'm afraid Europeans uh, may disagree with you. They say, look, we share the same values, political institutions, uh, maybe the same vision about what the future might hold for the world in the 21st century. Next question for Mas. China and the EU have both voiced their firm objections to U.S. tariffs on steel and aluminum and are expected to collaborate more closely to uphold the idea of a multilateralism and free trade. First of all, why do we have to defend the principle of multilateralism to push back trade protectionism? Well, but this is what our modern economy is built on. It's built on the assurance that we can build the global supply chains and in the global protection systems and, and the protection legally for these uh, are a multilateral uh, rule-based uh, trading regime like the WTO. For us as business people that this is upheld is of essential importance for our future uh, uh, stability and our interest in continuing to invest and create uh, such global supply chains. And the, to add on to that I think for the rest of the world too even for non-Europeans or non-Chinese or non-Americans, the global supply chain is very, very important because what does it mean, the global supply chain? It is, it is a, a production system that enhances efficiency. And without that efficiency, Africa, South America, and the rest of Asia would not, would not have a chance to grow. To, to grow. But taking ZT as an example, it's most likely to be sentenced to the death penalty yes. by, I'm afraid, eventually by the lawmakers in the D.C. So do you think uh, this bad example showcases the American determination to cut off the value chain, to cut off the chain of globalization? And what does that mean globally? Well, again, I think these are two issues. Uh, the ZT issue was also about uh, a company not respecting uh, international norms of where it could trade. Exactly. So I think this was a good lesson for other companies who have mm -hmm. international aspirations. But uh, I agree that if we get disruptions to our global supply chains, that's going to be expensive for all of us, foreign companies as well as Chinese. Well, to sentence the ZTE to years of imprisonment is one thing. To sentence the to sentence Zeti to the death penalty is quite another. Uh, 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 that's why I emphasize deliberately the severity of the punishment. It might be an issue of overreaction 
No, I, I, would, I would put it slightly differently. What we see is a situation where Donald Trump had actually agreed to a settlement with ZTE that resuscitated by changing the management and putting in inspectors uh, from, the from the Treasury Department and so on and so forth, and a further fine of, I think it's $1.3 billion, okay, for having violated certain sanctions that have been imposed by the U.S. against North Korea and uh, Iran. But that is actually, in terms of ZTE, uh, the problem that I see is Congress now is going against it, thinking that what Donald Trump's agreement has with the Chinese is insufficient in terms of punishment. The vilification of China and the Chinese operators is becoming really, really dangerous. You see that vilification even in China Mobile since 11 years ago has applied to have an operating license in the U.S., and now it's been, it's been rejected. And even a small wind farm project by a major Chinese SOE in the United States is rejected by CFIUS. So this vilification and this anti-China mood which is being built is actually, I think, quite dangerous. This campaign of vilification and the witch hunting may not be very useful for having uh, free trade, fair trade, or uh, further advancement of globalization. However, um, let, me, let, let me focus on one specific issue concerning the importance and relevance of tariffs in the age of globalization. President Trump complains bitterly about excessive tariffs that have been used by visible and invisible tariffs used by business partners Europeans and the Chinese. So uh, to such a degree where he felt strongly that Americans uh, uh, suffered a lot and that's unfair. What do you make of his complaints? Well, uh, first I, I feel that um, he is mixing up the issue of the concerns that we share with the US administration and using the tariffs to put pressure on China uh, and to get back what the US perceives as being their loss uh, in terms of lost technology. But this is a dangerous game because it can go out of control. Uh, and when we start seeing tariffs being increased between nations uh, in a trade war, the first one who's going to suffer is the consumer. This is a de facto tax on the consumer. And uh, the second uh, who suffers are us who are building and living on global supply chains and production systems. So we need to keep the issues apart. I think <coughs> the most important way here forward is for China to be very much transparent about its plans to address those concerns that have been expressed by the US and by Europe and by other trading partners. In the case of the CETI and other issues, I think it's also about the transparency of Chinese companies going abroad and investing in the US and in, in Europe. So I think there are a number of lessons learned here that will help to diffuse tensions and misunderstandings. At the core of, the, of this issue is both addressing the concerns but also communicating. Well, uh, uh, the, the cru crucially important the word that you spoke of uh, in your response is, I'm afraid, uh, uh, particularly in the understatement of your analysis is uh, rules. Yeah. However, with the unilateral pullout from so many multilateral framework and agreements, uh, do you think this is a serious violation of the contract spirit uh, which w was first e e embarked upon or employed in the West to be more precise in Europe? And therefore, can we trust the President Trump who accuses China of uh, not having sufficient transparency, but what he does is also a violation of uh, you know, the, uh, the rules and principles of a contract. Contract is, is a lace groundwork for fair deals, doesn't it? Well, uh, as, a, as a business community, uh, we, as I said, we don't think that these actions are correct. At the same time, we think that China has uh, a number of issues that it needs to address, and that was from the beginning the root cause of the There's tension. No, the, uh, no doubt to say that, that the upcoming trade war, Charles, I'm afraid, is a part of a learning curve as China gets further integrated with the rest of the world. We have been pioneering 
uh, globalization. We stand for free trade because we are the biggest beneficiary of globalization. Look at the dividends that the consumers in China share. So, w what do you think of the uh, the accusation uh, between the two sides? Well, uh, first of all, the whole complaint, even during his campaign, was. China takes $500 billion from us every year in terms of exports to the United States. First of all, the whole way that's calculated is incorrect. Number one, you have services not included. You have also, what is left in China of an Apple iPhone is 7% of the cost of an iPhone. The components come from all over Southeast Asia, come from Japan, come from Korea, come from the United States, and so on and so forth. So using a actually totally invalid system to calculate how much China is stealing from the United States is totally absurd. That's to start with. And of course, Matt stresses every time when you talk about the bad things that the US or the Trump administration is doing, you have to stress that the Chamber of Commerce has issues with China. Now, First of all, China is still a developing country. I'm of an age where I participated in the Uruguay round at the GATT before the WTO, when countries of Europe, especially your home country yeah. in Sweden, were very concerned about how to help developing countries grow instead of bashing them on the head for doing things which we don't like. So I think China is learning a lot of lessons. China has gotten very big so it has to play a different role in the world economy than 30 years ago or 20 years ago. But we, we totally agree that China has come a very long way in these 40 years. I was here first time 1982. I'm a witness mm -hmm. to this fantastic change. Our point of view is that the things that we uh, raise as a concern with China are the things that China has said that it wants to do itself because it is needed to take the next steps to uh, Get, get to the next maturity level in the Chinese development. Yes. And now is the time to speed up that process. That is our view. I, I, would, I would add <coughs> something here. In terms of the financial sector, which is something that the Americans have been complaining about for ages and ages, of course, the British as well, because of London, the city, and so on and so forth. If 2008, China did not have the Great Wall in terms of blocking out the financial tsunami, it would have been a complete disaster in China because the flow of global capital has reached such levels with such leverage by these banks that it is very dangerous for fragile financial systems such as China had in 2008 if it did not block the tsunami from coming. Now, I think gradually the Chinese government has to feel that the opening of the market would not lead to potential systemic risks before they open it up. And they're gradually doing that. Because I, I'm in the finance <coughs> business. I see what hedge funds do. Mm. I see how in 1997 they destroyed the economies of Malaysia and Thailand and Indonesia and South Korea. Other than the issue of rules and transparency, maths, I'm afraid uh, we also need to take a careful look at the role the Chinese government plays in the process of integration, globalization. The Trump administration accuses Chinese government of uh, uh, interfering excessively. And yet, at the same time, I'm aware that the brightest call for renationalization of the British railways and uh, Look at the, uh, the industrial strikes by a French, mm. the railway uh, workers. I mean, uh, it's also nationalized. It's a state-run uh, uh, railway. So uh, nationalization seems to have been vilified by the United States. Uh, the state-run, the idea of being state-run is also mm. vilified by... So no wonder Martin Wolf, chief economist of the Financial Times, argued uh, politely and diplomatically, look, the United States and China have uh, two entirely different internal systems. Then we find ourselves talking past each other instead mm -hmm. of talking to each other. But let me, uh, let me just say the big contradiction here was that uh, during the financial crisis, China saved its own growth and uh, the global growth by um, 
for no trillion, trillion. It's, it's for a stimulus package. Program. Yeah. China had recognized that before uh, the financial crisis that it was in need of systemic reform. Unfortunately, the stimulus package exacerbated the those problem. structural problems. Mm -hmm. So the problems became even bigger. And I think this is something that we uh, need to recognize uh, and need to work on uh, to solve because the effect of that stimulus package caused some of the tensions that we are now also discussing. When we look at the, some chapters no, of history... Just uh, on, this, <coughs> on the stimulus package, um, Hank Paulson visited Beijing how many times during that period and how many phone calls actually literally begging China to put in a big stimulus package. Um, and the Chinese answer was, okay, you know, if it means something good for the rest of the world, we'll do it. The, the end result is really very painful. Right? And you're absolutely right. And China's suffering the bitterness of the pill now even. I agree, and, and that is why, why the need to deal with those problems, for example, mm -hmm the SOEs and overcapacity is even bigger now than it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a negative effect, I agree yeah. on that. Yeah. Yes. What do you think of the prospects that the United States will withdraw unilaterally from the WTO? There have been rumors that went viral on the internet about this, uh, this possibility that Trump is on many occasions shown apparent anger uh, with the rules of the WTO. He says that doesn't serve the national interest of the United States. So what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I think there is that risk because uh, if as these tariffs are implemented in China and EU and Canada and Mexico, especially with the new president in Mexico, starts challenging the U.S. action in the WTO, Mr. Trump could very well say, okay, you don't like what I'm doing? I'm out. This is what he said about the Paris Paris accord and so on and so forth. As a business community, uh, you know, we want the WTO to survive. And if you go back and look at these 20 plus years of WTO, 550 cases have been dealt by, by the WTO and all of them, or the majority, the vast majority, have been respected. So we think this is a joint um, responsibility to maintain this uniquely effective mm -hmm. and respected organization but it needs genuine engagement from all stakeholders. And here, here I think China, Europe, and other major um, economies play a very important role. Let me go back to the beginning of our discussion yeah, tonight. Uh, we spoke of the word national security and youth uh, compared uh, the almost non-existent army of Canada <laughs> uh, and used that to uh, criticize uh, the abusive use of the national security. Here is my question, Matt. Uh, do, do you think it sounds ridiculous for President Trump to cite national security in his efforts to protect the uh, American economy? Yes, it sounds very difficult to justify that way. We are also happy that, the w that the Europe uh, asked for consultations with the WTO on that issue. This is the right way to go about it. And Charles, very quickly, before we conclude this uh, very enlightening uh, discussion about the white paper on the WTO. I think ultimately the whole concept of globalization was something that everybody agreed to. Mm. The United States was a leader in the whole process. But when you start citing national security concerns, everybody can do that. And then it's all over. Thank you so much. <coughs> With that, we come to the end of this chapter on WTO. Uh, I'll see you next time. Goodbye.